Hi. Um, I was a postdoc with uh, Robbie Jacobs and Dave Neal you know, from 2009 to 2013. Um, over those four years, Dave worked with a pretty big team of students and collaborators. Um, but at least for myself, I'm not the type to pose for a lot of pictures. Um, I think there's other postdocs at the time similar. Um, so uh, this picture was actually taken last fall at Dave's funeral. Um, Hosang Kwan and Bo Hu were Dave's other postdocs for the, the same four years that I was there. Uh, Mandy Young is his uh, lab programmer. Um, he had a huge team that worked with them. It's a shame that the, the photos that are run up here. So Dave is in the photo, and um, I guess that's not entirely accurate. Uh, so this was taken in his lab in Melliora Hall, and the whiteboard behind us is filled with things you might expect to see on Dave Mill's whiteboard. Um, covariance terms, expectations, shifting probability distributions, graphical models, um, etc. The only thing that this photo doesn't capture is Dave's enthusiasm as he worked out the implication of his ideas and that whiteboard. Um, if you knew Dave at all, you can still picture him in this photo, kind of grinning and scribbling furiously as kind of he struggled to get his hands to keep up with his mind raising his head. Um, Bo, who was his postdoc for quite a few years, and Bo is currently working at a tech startup in Silicon Valley on computer vision. Um, at the funeral, Bo said that one thing that he learned from Dave that he values the most is the confidence and ability to just stand up at a whiteboard at a meeting and work through some derivation on a problem, starting from first principles. Um, obviously, it takes a lot of mathematical knowledge to be able to do that. But uh, more so, it takes a, a lot of confidence in yourself that you have the knowledge and that you have the tools and that you know, just put an arbitrary problem in front of you and you can break it down and do its kind of fundamental parts. Um, I think that, that confidence and ability was one of Dave's greatest gifts. Um, and I think that was also one of his gifts to his students, but I doubt he ever thought that's what he was teaching people. So it sounds cliche, but from my perspective, being a postdoc in his lab was like what it must have been like to be a painter studying in Paris in the 1920s. Um, to me, Rochester was a place, was the place to go to study probabilistic models, and working with both Robbie and Dave Nill was, was the opportunity of a lifetime for me. So what did I learn from working with Dave? Uh, well, for one, I learned a lot about Bayesian modeling, sensory motor control, and visual memory. Um, I think the most important thing I learned is to think harder. Um, research meetings with Dave were like a beginner playing a friendly game of chess against a grandmaster. I'm sure um, Robbie can verify. Um, over the course of four years, I pitched a lot, I mean, really a lot, in the New York ideas to Dave, and, and not one of them stuck. <laughs> so it was intimidating and, and frustrating to be a postdoc working with Dave. Um, you immediately see four steps ahead, again, just like a chess grandmaster. You can see kind of a year down the road where your idea is going to fail. Um, <laughs> and you can sort of explain the, the, ne the next half hour explaining why you know, you have to try and catch up with them. Um, so Dave challenged his students, but uh, if you know him, it was, it was never about him shooting down ideas. He was way too humble and modest for that. Um, it was about learning a skill that can't really be verbalized. Um, that's how to be a great scientist. Uh, by putting yourself in a challenging environment and just staying there until it, until it, sticks, until it sticks with you. Um, so something else that I learned from Dave is to never be satisfied with clumsy or analogous solutions. Um, this is terrible career advice, I'm sure, but we never chased after low-hanging fruit or did an experiment because it would lead to a quick paper. Dave wasn't interested in cute effects or catchy headlines. He was interested in finding bedrock and, and deep principles. Um, to me, he wanted a, a Newtonian theory of brain function. And I hope from the symposium you get the idea that uh, he, he's come really close to achieving that. <coughs> and the last thing I learned from Dave, I think is probably the most important, and that's, uh, well, in a lot of ways, being a postdoc today sucks. Uh, the job market's terrible, it's always going to be terrible, and then funding to support postdoc is hard to come by. Um, I started working with Dave in 2009, 
uh, right at the start of the Great Recession, and just about when every university had an outright hiring freeze. <laughs> Four years later, uh, I got my faculty position at Drexel University, and since then I've learned in a lot of ways being a junior faculty sucks too. <laughs> <laughs> But you can fill your life with problems, um, but life is short, and you only get so many trips around the sun, and it's up to us to find meaning in that. Um, Dave spent his life doing research that he absolutely loved. He didn't pick research questions to advance his career. He built a career around research that he wanted to do. So again, I'm sure that's terrible career advice. I think it's the only way to maximize the chances that on any given day, at any given moment, um, You'll actually enjoy what you're doing. So um, um, today, I want to give a, kind of a brief perspective on two different projects that uh, Dave, Robbie, and I worked on. So in both cases, it's uh, work that Dave started long before I was a postdoc. And so uh, I got to work from building on years and years of, of past research. So the first project is understanding sensory motor control and coordination. And this is uh, closely related to um, Paul's research and talk, so I'm going to move a little quickly through that. And the second project is a project about understanding visual short-term memory. Um, but maybe surprisingly, it ends up using the same basic computational tools. So you might think that every talk about Dave's research would have to absolutely revolve around Bayes' theorem. Um, but there's another perspective on Dave's research that I think is more fundamental. And the idea is that Bayesian inference is uh, just part of a more general and elegant approach to understanding human vision and motor control. And that more general approach is based around maximizing the utility of behavior subject to constraints. So uh, to me, this slide contains kind of the Newtonian theory of sensory motor control. Um, the first line says that the brain doesn't have direct access to the state of the world. The best it can do is form estimates given noisy and time delayed sensory signals. The second line says that the goal of the system is to turn a status estimate into a plan for controlling behavior. And the third line just says that there's some cost function associated with different states and actions. For example, in walking, there's a cost to tripping and falling down the stairs. There's also a cost to taking 10 minutes to plan each step. So the goal of sensory motor behavior is to minimize costs with respect to state estimates and feedback control models. Um, What's really fascinating about this approach to me is that you don't need to assume Bayes' theorem anywhere in this. Uh, Bayes' rule isn't an axiom. Um, this approach works by uh, minimizing costs, and out of that, you find that you kind of re-implement the Bayes', Bayes rule. Um, so uh, Bayes', Bayes inference is kind of very closely associated with Dave's research, but um, that's, that's almost kind of a, a distraction. He was interested in systems that work well in the natural world. And um, to get at that, you need the idea of tasks, and the idea of costs, and the idea that the brain is really trying to minimize costs subject to the, the constraints it has to work with. So concretely, just imagine a simple task, moving your hand from point A to point B, and then touching somewhere in target C. So when Dave started doing this research with his postdoc, Jeff Saunders, uh, a common theory was that reaching behavior consists of two phases, fast, holistic, pre-programmed movement um, that doesn't really involve much of his vision, followed by a slower adjustment phase that requires visual guidance. So this mathematical optimal feedback control framework makes a different prediction. Visual signals are noisy and time delayed, but they're not useless. So rather than ignoring visual feedback until the end of the movement, the idea is that the brain should continuously integrate and predict the state of the hand and use that to better control the um, motor system. So working with this postdoc Jeff Saunders, um, incidentally, they presented this research at the very first meeting of ESS in 2001. Um, they were able to show that this kind of mathematical control framework isn't just an elegant a mathematical approach to modeling motor control. It's actually a descriptively accurate theory of how uh, people make reaching movements. And it turns out it's surprisingly hard to design an experiment that tests this theory. So intuitively, you might think you could just ask people to make uh, hand movements with their eyes closed, or you could kind of turn off the display halfway through uh, reaching movement. 
Um, but that tells you something about how the motor system works when there is no visual feedback. And what Dave wanted to know is how does the brain use visual feedback when it's available during the course of movement. So um, to get at that, uh, Dave and Jeff uh, moved to the VR domain. Uh, they had subjects making reaching movements in a VR environment. And the nice feature there is that you can control the visual feedback that subjects get. You can perturb visual signals without subjects even realizing that they're kind of getting distorted visual feedback. And using motion tracking, you can kind of measure very precise properties of, of human feedback control. And as it turns out, um, human movement follows pretty closely the prediction to this optimal control framework. So according to this idea that uh, movement is maximizing utility, the goal of the system isn't just to get a Bayesian accurate estimate of hand position, but rather to use that information to minimize costs. So that predicts that when goals change, the properties of feedback control will also change as well. So obviously, if you execute hand movements with your eyes closed, performance gets worse. But the interesting thing is that if the brain is using some form of optimal feedback control, you should be able to predict just how much worse performance will get. So in this example, the model closes its eyes when it reaches point B and then kind of executes the rest of the reaching movement with its eyes closed. Uh, so obviously, its performance gets worse. The solid line shows the actual motor trajectory and misses the intended target. Um, but more to the point, the model has a good sense of how bad its performance is likely to be. So if the goal is to touch a small target, then executing this task with your eyes closed is a bad idea. But if the target's larger, then you should be able to predict that the same level of uncertainty is less costly. And so that should, uh, in turn, influence the uh, feedback control law and hand movements. So that's kind of where I picked up uh, this line of research with Dave. And my question that I kind of uh, chased down was kind of a really small point after this. And that was just the idea of whether we could use this framework as a theory of human eye movements. So uh, if you can predict when visual feedback is useful and when it's less useful, is the brain using that information to time eye movements? So the task we came up with, uh, again, kind of VR, but now we're adding eye tracking as well as motion tracking to VR. So this is a nightmare to, to set up and implement. Um, Imagine I dumped a bunch of screws out on a table, and half of them are Phillips head and half of them are flathead screws, and uh, you just have to sort them back into two different piles. So in that task, you need vision for two things, uh, identifying whether the next screw is going to be Phillips or flathead, um, as well as guiding your hand to drop that screw in the container, the correct container. So the brain has a challenge. How do you divide vision between these two tasks? You need vision for perceptual identification, and you need vision for motor control. Um, how you should allocate your vision, of course, depends on the costs defined by the task, and the resources that the brain has to work with. If you make the motor task harder, you should allocate more of your visual gaze to motor guidance. You can do that by making the jars smaller. And if you make visual discrimination harder, you should allocate more of your gaze to determining whether the next screw is a Phillips head or a flat head. You can control that by just kind of Explain them to be more similar. So I don't want to kind of get lost in the details of experimental design and methodology, but um, in this experiment you can plot utility curves for the timing of eye movements. So the x-axis here is fixation duration, and the y-axis is performance on the task. So it's sort of a curve that shows you the optimal time to make eye movements between guiding your hand to drop off one screw and looking back to figure out whether the next screw is Phillips or flathead. So the red curves are predictions of kind of uh, expected utility, um, in this case, the probability of completing the task correctly. And the blue lines are uh, human performance across nine different conditions where we manipulated uh, task difficulty. And so what you see is that um, the timing of eye movements is kind of very closely predicted by the costs of kind of poorly timed eye movements in the experiment. So at the time we published this study, a common theory was that eye movements and hand movements were kind of linked in a non-adaptive manner in reaching movements. Um, but those experiments were done in a very artificial task. 
And uh, one thing that Dave was adamant about throughout his whole career is that it's not enough to understand how the brain works in some kind of strange laboratory paradigm that, you know, across millions of years of evolution, we have no reason to care or think about. Um, you need to study behavior in natural tasks where mistakes have consequences, and often it's the cost of error that are the best predictors of the perception and motor control. So this idea has kind of um, taken hold. A couple of years ago, Daniel Wolford and Michael Lang published a position paper that uh, really summarized the spirit of Dave's research in motor control. I'll just read the first line here. So motor behavior might be viewed as a problem of maximizing the utility of movement outcome in the face of sensory and motor capacity uncertainty. So it's a step that this, this view isn't actually all that controversial today. Um, maybe it is, but I'm kind of biased. Um, I just want to point out that uh, Dave's research was kind of instrumental in kind of establishing this, this idea. Um, so he, his, his influence would kind of extend far beyond just kind of simple um, um, Bayesian inference for the sake of perception for its own sake. So uh, now I want to shift gears from sensory motor control to talk about uh, more recent research in visual memory. And this is work that uh, Dave and, and Robbie and I have carried out for the last three or four years. So hopefully the story won't change a whole lot. Um, so motor control is the minimization of costs, such as constraints. To what extent can we understand visual memory as the minimization of costs, such as constraints? And the only trick in this case is how do we understand constraints on memory capacity at a computational level? And so in order to get there, I just first want to argue that Bayesian inference by itself isn't the right framework for understanding perceptual memory. And so why not? Um, well, we know that visual memory is biased by the statistics of visual information. So if you have some distribution of stimuli across trials, and then you present some stimulus on a given trial to the solid vertical line, um, and then you ask what people will remember, um, their memory estimate will be biased, and will be kind of biased in a way that you'd expect based on Bayesian inference and bias towards the prior statistics and information. So that seems like great. So maybe we should be explaining visual memory as Bayesian inference. In that case, uh, your memory representations are just kind of extracting some summary statistic from posterior belief distribution given kind of noisy evidence. If so, then we can model visual memory using the same kind of graphical model notation that's been so successful in explaining visual perception. Um, but the challenge really comes when you try and specify conditional probability distribution. What's the probability distribution of memory errors given a given visual input? And you can just kind of pick some distribution, some Gaussian distribution with some variance, and you can produce plots that look right and look Bayesian. But there's kind of no kind of deep computational principle there. You just kind of move from uh, theorizing at Mars computational level to model fitting. So um, we've lost something there. Um, if you follow the research in visual memory, you kind of also know that one of the big um, points that are debated in the last few years are set size effects. And that's basically the more things you store in visual memory, the worse your memory precision becomes. So again, you can kind of model that as, as Bayesian inference by just assuming that your memory representation gets noisier the more things you store in memory. Um, or you're just kind of parameter fitting. You're just kind of saying, when there's just one thing you have to remember, this is this is the variance of memory. When there's two things, this is the variance. The problem with that kind of uh, theorizing is that it's kind of, it's again, it's kind of lost the, the connection to the deep fundamental principles that uh, Dave was insistent that all of his research uh, address. So the idea that we came up with is to treat visual memory as a communication channel um, using Shannon's information theory. So that's not really a new idea. There's half a century of using information theory to study human memory and perception. I think maybe our only insight was to look at a particular branch of information theory called uh, rate distortion theory. <coughs> And really what's special or unique about this kind of subfield of information theory is that it's fundamentally concerned with minimizing the costs of error. So um, you have a channel with some input and output, 
But um, the next step is to define a cost function. If you send a signal X into the channel, you get a signal Y out on the other end. What is the cost of making that error? And that, to me, is kind of the fundamental computational problem that visual memory has to, has to face. So the goal is to minimize costs over the space of possible, uh, space of possible channels. Um, so you have to specify some cost function, and you have some channel capacity. So you can work out the math, and, and this talk won't be a lot of math, but uh, having the simple and elegant theory is nice, but you actually want it to be able to account for human performance. And it turns out that this simple idea actually does a really good job of kind of preset size effects. So you just assume that you have some capacity in memory, and that the more things you need to store, you just kind of divide your memory by n, where n is the number of things stored in memory. So that kind of predicts, uh, well, it doesn't predict, it sort of demands that your memory performance will get worse with increasing set size. So that's kind of a, a nice feature of a theory when it kind of demands that you see the effects that you actually observe in behavior. Um, it accounts for set size effects. It also accounts for memory biases. And uh, once you get kind of really far down into the math, you find out that this, uh, this information theory approach, again, you don't have to assume Bayes' rule anywhere in it. Bayes' rule isn't an axiom in the approach. But kind of despite that, you get Bayesian inference out of it. And that's the consequence of, of minimizing costs. That's uh, sort of the connection between uh, information theory, Bayesian inference, and optimal feedback control. In each case, you have kind of constraints or limitations, and the challenge is to minimize costs subject to those constraints. So to me, the most exciting uh, aspect of this approach is that once you define memory as uh, an optimally efficient system for minimizing the cost of memory error, then you can start connecting visual memory to natural tasks. So presumably out in the world, uh, misremembering things has some cost to the organism. Um, but we don't know what is the cost. What is the brain's cost function that it uses in, in uh, its design for visual memory? So uh, each of these uh, panels on the left shows a different possible cost function. So the top one is a quadratic function, and then that the cost for memory error is the squared error between the input and the output of the channel. Um, that's just one possible assumption. You can kind of define the absolute value cost, the step function. Um, the point is that each of those predicts a different pattern of optimal memory errors in some tasks. But nobody's sort of attempted to look at what is the brain's cost function for visual memory. So that's an idea that I kind of really started to pursue uh, last spring. Um, it turns out that by combining tools for information theory and decision theory, and uh, in particular something called inverse decision theory, which has been used in uh, motor control research, you can measure the implicit cost function for visual memory. So the left figure plots um, subjective utility of memory error is a function of physical error. So in other words, it shows the mental cost of making different kinds of memory errors. So in addition to measuring cost functions for behavior, you can also turn that around, and you can also compare that to predictions that you can derive from natural tasks. Um, so the panel on the right shows a family of cost functions derived from the task of minimizing the probability of making saccade errors in a simple visual search task. Um, the details are kind of irrelevant for now. Um, but the point is that this kind of analysis gives a whole new perspective on things like visual expertise and individual differences in, in visual memory. So does a visual expert have higher memory capacity as measured in bits? Do they have better knowledge of the statistics of the environment? Or is it the case that their cost function is better matched to the actual cost of making errors within the domain of expertise. So these are questions that we couldn't even formulate a couple years ago, um, but it's kind of it's an, it's an exciting development in this line of research. Um, at the same time, it's also kind of where the story has to get a little bit of speed. And um, I've written up a manuscript talking about everything I just presented and sent it to Ravi and Dave. And, uh, I made the mistake of including both of them as co-authors in the paper. Um, Robbie and Dave both asked that I take their names off the manuscript. 
And so I guess that's kind of a bad sign when your postdoc mentors <laughs> suggest that you should take their names off your work. Um, but uh, in his email back to me, uh, his comments, Dave said something like, this is really uh, your own work and contributions have kind of this contributions kind of shifted to becoming a cheerleader. Um, and so that email is the last uh, con contact I ever had with Dave before he passed away. Um, so I guess it's fitting that the last thing he would tell me is to kind of go off and be an independent scientist. Um, but I think it also shows that he was just incredibly selfless as a mentor. Um, obviously, it's sad that kind of he had to leave part of the story. Uh, so there's so much more exciting work to be done. Uh, but life is short for all of us, I guess. Um, I don't want to end on a sad note. Uh, so Dave Mill was a world-leading researcher on Bayesian models and theories of perception. Uh, but I hope it's supposed to remind you that this narrow view doesn't do justice to all his accomplishments. Um, so in the last 10 or few years, motor control has kind of been reevaluated as an economic problem, minimizing the costs under uh, numerous constraints. And so the idea is actually not too far from uh, bounded rationality. When the relevant constraints include uncertain sensory signals and noisy motor system, you end up with kind of Bayesian-like behavior as a natural consequence. Well, not Bayesian-like, you end up with Bayesian behavior as a consequence. Um, but I think what I've tried to convey is that uh, a narrow focus on Bayes' rule or Bayesian inference for its own sake, um, it's a bit of an oversimplification. Um, in the last three or four years, uh, Dave, Robin, and I started to develop that same approach to explaining visual memory. So the idea is that memory errors have costs, and those costs shape the nature of human memory. Um, there's a lot of exciting work still to be done with that idea, uh, but I'm truly grateful I was able to get started down that path uh, working with someone like Dave Mill. So thanks for your time. Again, we have a minute or two while we set up for questions or comments.